Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, our last Data Hub Cafecito for 2021. Um, and for today's Cafecito, we're going to do a brief overview of our Data Hub sent, uh, data products that uh, for the fall of 2021. And then I'm going to transition to our research associates here, Dr. Uh, Matthew Nadal and Dr. Celiani Rivera. And then we have our other research associate that will be joining us via Zoom, Dr. Elizabeth Taveras and um, Dr. Jose La Guarta. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And um, let me begin with a brief overview. So I'm gonna share my screen here. So some of our products that we've started off um, for the fall semester, we started off with the four year anniversary of Hurricane Maria. And the beauty of this is all interactive and you have all the data that it's in this um, site. You have all of the data available to you. And um, so with this website right here, we have our four year um, timeline um, produced by Carlos Montes. It's a very uh, sort of overview of what has happened between uh, uh, the third year anniversary to now. So please, you know, take a moment and um, uh, review our timeline here. It's very well put together and sort of pinpointing all of these um, events that had happened between then and, and now. Um, we've also looked into the impacts of the aging population, where we really did go through a deep dive into the data. And we found so, sort of like the impacts of the uh, Hurricane Maria and the impacts of the elderly age population, what they look like now and how the senior age population is growing um, between then and now. And then we also looked into a deeper dive into the um, sort of the barrios in which the, the senior age population were living in highly socially vulnerable areas. So all of this information is available to you. We have these maps right here. And if you click on any of them, the pop-out box will show you the, the data indicated here. You also have the, you can download the data that we've mapped. And then lastly, we looked into the disabled population. And again, one of our key findings was that over one fifth of Puerto Rico's population um, is disabled. And they were also equally not distributed geographically in terms of um, where they, they live. And we also found that half of Puerto Rico's disabled population lives below the poverty line. And the impact here is that they still are undergoing through um, sort of with the rebuilding process, they seem to be still isolated um, in terms of um, the impact of Hurricane Maria. So similar to the senior age population, if you click on any of the maps here, you see the, the data related to that. And you could also get the data that relates to that. And then um, let me go back here. We also did a decennial analysis for Puerto Rico. So we looked at the uh, decennial 2020 data. And here we looked at um, race, ethnicity, and population. And we also did a cafecito that relates to this. And again, um, all of this is available to you. And we looked at sort of, we compared the 2010 and 2020 um, decennial census data in terms of race, ethnicity. And in this brief, we see that there was a 54.8% drop of those who selected one race in Puerto Rico. And um, we also did a, see a significant decrease of those who identified as white alone in Puerto Rico between 2010 and 2020. And we also did a very quick analysis of the um, Puerto Rico's population here. And then in this part, this section of the analysis, we did see a drop of about 12% of Puerto Rico's population decline between 2010 and 2020. So that's like a difference of about 440,000 um, individuals that have declined. Um, and lastly, let me go here, our research um, director of policy here, he did a brief related to decennial redistricting research, and he looked into Florida and uh, New York. So again, anything here that you see, it's 
downloadable. So we looked at population change by state between 2010 and 2020. And um, we looked at these spatial changes at the county level. So again, everything here is available to you at your fingertips. Tables here as well. Um, and that's it. I mean, we are planning on um, pushing out the uh, another research brief related to the impact of the earthquakes, the one year anniversary. And we do have a lot of interesting projects that we're gonna push um, out in the spring of 2022. So without further ado, I would like to turn our focus to our um, research associates, Dr. Matthew McDowell. Awesome, hi everyone. And thank you, Jennifer. Um, I wanna thank, um, Sandro for giving me this opportunity as one of the incoming research associates this year. Um, special thank you to, to Dr. Yarimar Bonilla for giving me that opportunity. And thank you, of course, to the, the larger Centro community and all of the folks that are watching or will watch it at some point soon. Um, and of course, I just want to give a special shout out to Jose Camacho, who is the technical mastermind behind <laughs> all this. So thank you so much. I know he's not often seen, he's not seen on camera, but he is very present. Um, so I'm going to jump gears a bit. Um, and so jumping gears in terms of moving back to the 19th century and also moving within the sphere of culture and the arts. Um, so the major project that I will be working on during my time at Centro is the development of a book manuscript. Um, it is tentatively called Descent from the Edges of the Late Spanish Empire, the Philippines and Puerto Rico aesthetic gestures toward other possibilities for the nation, right? That's a really long title, but if anyone has that like, recommendations or suggestions for a shorter one, drop me a line. Um, so this work, engaging the fields of Puerto Rican and Philippine studies, and even Spanish Peninsular studies, my research is informed by scholarship on the histories and cultures of empire, critical race studies, and aesthetic politics. Its interests in cross-regional and inter-imperial intersectionalities and parallels contribute specifically to scholarship of comparative racialization, colonialisms and nationalisms, and archipelagic studies. This research project juxtapositionally examines novels by Puerto Rican writer Manuel Steno Gambia and Philippine writer Jose Rizal, alongside the paintings of Puerto Rican artist Francisco Oyer and the Filipino artist Juan Luna. They, in order, I read these texts in order to highlight how each engage with and interrogate the limits of cultural representation within dominant aesthetic forms and modalities. I argue that these interventions are simultaneously expressions of political dissent that challenge the exclusionary limits of what and which peoples could constitute the modern Spanish nation. I contend that these works were critical of Spain's racial politics of exclusion in contravened in imperial-wide assertions regarding colonial people's perennial underdevelopment, so often used to justify the maintenance of Spain's colonies as sites of exception to the modern nation, and thereby designating their respective populations as ineligible for the rights and freedoms of modern citizenship. Countering dehumanizing racialized tropes, pervasive in colonial and metropolitan arts, letters and political discourse. These writers and artists not only sought to extend the borders of the nation and the qualifications for citizenship, but dared to imagine more radical aesthetic and political possibilities beyond inherently racist structures, epistemologies and practices particular to the modern nation state. <coughs> This project indeed asks us to challenge dominant interpretations of what some might call foundational novels and paintings, narratives and images of both the Philippines and Puerto Rico. I push against reading these works as foundational fictions. To borrow the term coined by literary critic Doris Summer in her reading of cultural texts, primarily produced from an already independent Spanish America in the 19th century, Indeed, a new approach to cultural production from the Philippines and Puerto Rico need to be read differently, not least of all, because both continue to be colonies of Spain in the 19th century. 
I argue that reading these works as foundational fictions implicitly presumes that the political motor animating them is a desire to found or establish an independent nation state and or interpolate its corresponding imagined community. Part of the intervention I make here asks us to rethink other ways of which the shape and constitution of the nation or perhaps some other form of being with others and being in community, which we still don't have a name for, may have been imagined. In his reading of Jose Rizal's novel, No Limit Benedict Anderson, for example, in his now classic text, Imagined Communities, assumes that the reader of Jose Rizal's novel is no other than, quote, we Filipino readers. If we can extrapolate a bit, had Anderson read La Charca, would he have also claimed that perhaps Seno Gandia's readership was only and exclusively we Puerto Rican readers? Mm. By strictly delimiting the readership of these two novels to we Filipinos or we Puerto Ricans, on the other, on the other hand, respectively, we ignore the more global reach of these works. And on the other, the possibility that the borders of the nation that each imagined were not necessarily limited to the geopolitical borders of colonial Philippine or Puerto Rican archipelagos. Indeed, parallel examples of other political possibilities and forms include imagining a federation of Spanish American nations best expressed in Nuestro America by Cuban writer Jose Marti, which of course has been studied ad nauseum, mm -hmm. and even a confederation of Caribbean island nations that have been the center of recent scholarship by exciting work of Yolanda Martinez San Miguel mm -hmm. and Caterina Gonzalez Seligman, for example. So in dialogue with their scholarship, my book attempts to read Puerto Rican and Philippine cultural production of this period in order to uncover other possibilities or other futures past that have since become lost to us in the 21st century moment. At the, same, at, at the time these novels were published and these paintings were exhibited, empire continued to be a reality and an ongoing viable possibility, one which undoubtedly required radical change and transformation. Nonetheless, I assert that these were still anti-colonial works in that they are critical of the colonial status quo and sought diverse ways to address and tackle the colonial question, even if they did not necessarily look to express their anti-colonial position through violent revolution and independence. In short, I'm arguing that anti-colonialism takes other forms and expressions that are no less radical in their own right. Important to, to this book project is therefore to highlight each writer's and each artist's interventions in dominant cultural form and practice and demonstrate how these interventions might be understood as gestures toward other possibilities or at least horizons of possibilities that is neither reducible to a future that maintains the colonial status quo or demands outright independence. More central to this project is not so much um, what those possibilities may have been, but rather how these works challenge and provoke the reader or the viewer to imagine those other possibilities. For this reason, I focus specifically on moments or sites rife with blaring silences, hidden presences and or unresolvable tensions, which I argue draw attention to the violence and limits of cultural representation and signal other ways of making sense of and being in the world that can never find adequate expression within dominant aesthetic or political forms. In short, this requires that we read with, against, and between the grain of the literary or visual texts, or perhaps be more attentive to what lies beyond the margins of the page or the edges of the canvas in order to imagine otherwise. Um, how am I on time? Oh, okay, great. <laughs> So um, a, a big chunk of this work is coming uh, is being developed from my dissertation. And so a big chunk of the work that I plan on doing here in Centro is to fully develop it. And understanding, for example, that the dissertation focus on such canonical works by privileged, um, by privileged Creole elites, part of the research that I'm hoping to do during my time, hopefully do some archival work in Puerto Rico is to examine, study and find some of the works of less known understudied writers. Um, in particular, um, 
I'm working on an analysis of the plays of the, of the Black Puerto Rican poet and playwright Eleuterio Derges, some of whose work um, was rediscovered and included in an anthology of Black Puerto Rican writing, um, which was edited um, back in 2009 by Roberto Ramos Perea. So this more, more globally, this project looks to not only highlight the work of an understudied writer, but also provide a different perspective on other horizons of possibility and or imagined futures for, for late 19th century Puerto Rico. So I think uh, I will leave it at that. Um, if you have any questions, comments, I'm much more animated in person when not reading. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, can you just say quickly, I know you're going to Puerto Rico um, over the summer. Um, I, I think you mentioned some universities that you plan on going to for your archives. Can you? discuss a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, I thought it was interesting. So I think um, there's a number of different archives I plan on looking or going to. Um, and I think one of those is um, the personal archive of Manuel Seno Gandia, which is located at the Universidad Central de Bayamón. Um, I believe from my understanding, this archive is still very much unprocessed. Uh, a lot of, you know, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And so you know, part of the research would be to think about, you know, going through his letters, going through his personal writings to, you know, flesh out other, I think, beyond the novel, kind of his personal views and takes on, on the question of nation and empire. Um, the other sites, of course, include the Ateneo Puerto Riqueño, which, you know, can, can still continues to be kind of the depository of 19th century um, cultural production to look particularly you know, at the works of Oyer. And I do believe that some of the, um, the, the writers, the Black Puerto Rican writers work is, is, is held there. Um, so those are just some of, or two examples of the sites that I'm hoping awesome. to find when I'm there. So I'm very thank you. exciting. Maybe. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> well, I look forward to sharing it. Yeah. <laughs> so now we're going to transition to Dr. Semiani Rivera. All right. Yes. The floor is yours. I am so excited to be part of this moment of Centro as I, it feels like a truly interdisciplinary space. It feels like a space that thrives on data and finding out information from the census. And then I have a colleague who we are like looking comparatively at global dynamics of Puerto Ricanness and Filipinoness. It's just like a really vibrant space to be in right now. And I'm really, really grateful uh, for that opportunity. I'm also really grateful of the work that Seiva interpreters are doing and also the Babilla Collective. And I'm gonna try to move at the speed of the interpretation. So if you feel that I'm going a little slow, please let me know in the chat and I'll try to gauge you know, that pacing. Um, I'm mostly here at Centro to work on a project that has been very close to my heart um, over the last two decades um, that I've been doing research as a Caribbeanist, um, looking particularly at the relationship of Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico. And in this um, two years that I will have here, I aim to focus my analysis. I aim to focus my analysis on the relationship between Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic. And so I'm gonna read a little bit about this um, book project description um, that um, I have been working on and share with you the tentative title of this manuscript, que es De un pájaro las dos patas, queer media and performance in the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. De un pájaro las dos patas is a book project that spotlights intermingled Dominican and Puerto Rican past, present, and futures. It traces the current momentum reflected in the plethora of queer performances by young generations in both Caribbean countries back to the uh, turn of the 21st century. It maps the growth of body and sex positivity discourses in their archipelago and uses them to identify key generational shifts um, in the expression of irreverence and detachment from cis-heteropatriarchal norms 
or the censoring of heterosexual and conforming to assigned uh, sex at birth is systems of power. Sex positive attitudes are a direct response, of course, to sex negativity, which we grew up with, uh, or attitudes that attach shame and judgment to people's varying experiences and feelings about sexuality. This study then inquires how our queer performers and media makers currently revolutionizing Puerto Rican and Dominican popular culture imagination of how queer, trans, and non-binary bodies and experiences have transited and shaped the public sphere in these two adjacent countries in the greater Antilles region of the Caribbean. It is precisely the region's similarities and difference that makes the comparison so rich. The Dominican Republic is a capitalist democratic republic and has been so since 1960. Puerto Rico has been a capitalist democratic commonwealth with the United States since 1952. Both countries also sadly share an unconstitutional penchant for the institutionalization of Christian values in government. Religious fundamentalism and the power of conservative groups have been two of the biggest obstacles to the promotion of laws and policies to protect LGBTQI plus people. In both countries, a proactive right has been growing through an increasingly strong evangelical presence that shares similar goals with the international ex-gay movement. Feminist organizations, especially those in the Dominican Republic, have reported that evangelical and a Catholic alliance is particularly worrying because the former cannot compete with the level of access to economic, media, and human resources of the latter. In very recent history, these two national spaces have also seen the rise of protests like the Puerto Rican Verano Boricua, or Ricky Renuncia in 2019, and the Dominican protest coined El Trabucaso. This protest has, can be distinguished from others in the past from the organic reliance on the fact that several Caribbean celebrities like Presidente, Bad Bunny, Anita Nazario, Juan Luis Guerra, Rita Indiana, Icharitín Goico, mobilize their fame to encourage others to join the Christ for transparency and democracy. This modality of loosely related groups of protests and political gatherings has worked as a methodology to hold sustained periods of dissent throughout the 21st century around the world. From the Arab Spring of 2011 that resulted in regime changes in Tunisia and Egypt to the racial unrest in the United States channeled to the Black Lives Matters movements in 2013 and then again in 2020, to the global widespread of the 2019 Chilean anthem, A Rapist in Your Path, there is an observable tendency towards decentralized so towards the decentralized emergence, yet organic orchestration of manifestations and performances whose objectives are not only aided, but fueled by the strategic use of social media. This study breaks down how iconic protests like El Perreo Combativo, through which, which roughly translates to combative twerking, which took place in uh, the context of Ricky Renuncia, connects to the emergence of a Dominican figure like the Dembo rapper Tokicha Altagracia Peralta in 2020. Tokicha is known for her mobilization of same gender desire uh, for her confident demeanor and way out attitude. El Perreo Combativo took place on the steps of the Metropolitan Cathedral Basilica of St. John the Baptist in Old San Juan in Puerto Rico on July 24 of 2019 within the context of Ricky Renuncia protests. This event converses with the scantily clad images published on August 19, 2021 by Tokisha, sensually posing next to the statue of the Virgen o la, la Nuestra Señora de la Altagracia en Jarabacoa en la República Dominicana, the Dominican Republic. 
while one highlights individuality in the creation of controversial media content for a neoliberal urban music market, and the other represents a collective act of challenging state sanctioned injustice through consensual feminist and queer twerking, the aspect that my research seeks to highlight is that both of them disregard Judeo Christian values of modesty, modesty and dignity to push back against one of the greatest symbols of colonial morality, religiosity. A second and concrete example of shared queer performance practice by younger generations in both countries can be seen through the study of Vogue. Vogue created, mastered, and still sustained by black and brown matriarchal shows in communities, families in New York since the 1970s. Um, especially connects to Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic through a movement and chanting tool set that results familiar as it is inheritance of our Black and Latinx, non-binary, queer, and trans ancestors and siblings in the diaspora. Emerging from Harlem and the Bronx, Vo uh, Vogue and ballroom cultures have been traced in Mexico City, Mexico, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Santiago de Chile between 2013 and 2016, and they have slowly developed into Colombian cities like Medellin, Bogota, Cúcuta, and Pereira since 2016, as well as being present in other Latin American and Caribbean countries. Like in Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic since 2017, there, the incursion of alternative drag and voguing scenes have grown side alongside the feminist and LGBTQIA plus cultural movements themselves. And I'm gonna stop here with that written part of what I'm working on. And I just wanna talk a little bit about the rest of the projects that I'm very excited to conduct while I am at Centro. Um, one of those projects um, will consist of inviting, uh, creating a panel of experts about contemporary feminisms and sexualities in the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico and a, a sub subsequently, subsequently, mm -hmm. and subsequently after that program, um, potentially developing a special volume in Central Journal to highlight the voices that were both invited and also who responded to a call for papers um, for that topic. Um, I'm also um, going to continue my work um, in the archipelago of Puerto Rico, for example, engaging in symposia at the Colloquio del Otro Lao conference that is happening in March. I am part of two panels and a workshop. Um, one panel is precisely about Quisqueya Queer, and it's a collaboration between Puerto Rican and Dominican um, activists. Another one is um, around this notion of um, pleasure methodologies or methodologías del placer um, with uh, a series of um, social media um, influencers that use um, sexual liberation as a motor for um, their work in Puerto Rico. And finally, I am working alongside with Plataforma Eje, Eh, in Puerto Rico, eh, la, la, la Boribogue in Puerto Rico, and Draguealo in the Dominican Republic to create a voguing tour um, that will have its first stop in the Dominican Republic in April 2021, its second stop in San Juan in November 2022, I'm sorry, both of these dates, 2022. And finally, uh, a big ball here in New York City, bringing both Dominican and Puerto Rican communities to perform here, potentially in the Bronx. Um, so I am very excited to be able to continue to think about all of this work that I have been doing for close to 15 years, um, both across the archipelago and also be in a more international, transnational, global conversation. And I'm very excited to answer any comments or questions that you may have. So please make sure to leave comments or questions so that we can engage in a little bit of a conversation. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Siliani. It sounds very exciting work. A lot of work. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're going to move on to Dr. Elizabeth Saveras, who's going to be joining us via Zoom. So welcome. Hola. Thank you for um, including me in this panel. Uh, give me a quick second while I present. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon. Today I'm going to share my work in preparation also for a book manuscript on the lived experiences and contributions of Puerto Ricans in the diaspora on the development of a peace culture in the US. Today I focus on the pioneros at the beginning of the colonia from the 1800s to the 1930s. As we begin, I want to bring awareness that today many of us are on the land of the Lenape and I acknowledge their presence, legacy, and spirit. We started to learn from the youth what was happening to them in the schools. When I first went to kindergarten, I was slapped by the teacher for speaking in Spanish. And I went home and told my mother what had happened. And my mother did not know how to speak English, but she went over there and she gave them a piece of her mind. Mm -hmm. Seloda says that they will take you to jail if you don't take your children. Um. So the damage of racism and discrimination on the Puerto Rican community has had a long lasting, uh, has had long lasting effects. And the experiences shared in this clip reverberate with other Puerto Ricans uh, in the collective memory of Puerto Ricans in the diaspora. Um, here, this project has great significance for educators and the community at large. The project addresses the lacunae in schools of education where the story of Puerto Ricans in the fight for equity and education has been silenced and sometimes we can call it, uh, it has been erased. The primary sources and oral histories included in this project are authentic resources to understand the lived experiences of Puerto Ricans in the 19th, uh, 8th, 19th and 20th centuries. The materials are valuable because they mirror the lives of, growing, of the growing Latinx student populations throughout the US. The participants' histories serve as role models for minoritized students on how to navigate learning and thriving in school settings that are too infrequently inclusive or welcoming. In addition, the materials help viewers understand how they can join in advocating for their community's needs. Lastly, materials serve as a point of entry in exploring identity development and issues of acculturation. Stateside Puerto Rican enclaves predate the signing of the Treaty of Paris in 1898. Eugenio Maria de Hostos, for example, arrived in 1869. He was part of a group of Puerto Ricans who fought for Puerto Rico's independence from Spain, along with Segundo Ruiz Belviz, Ramon Emeterio Betances y Alacán, and poetess and revol revolutionary Lola Rodriguez de Tio, who moved to New York City after she was desterrada, exiled, from Puerto Rico for her participation in the independence movement. The stories of the discrimination and racism are most poignant in the voices of Boricua who are Afro-descendientes, such as Pura Belpre, Arturo Schomburg, and Jesus Colón. In the stories, we learn how they define themselves outside the black and white narrative prevalent in the US, creating spaces where they could claim a range of identities within the Jim Crow era of the day. The loss of native languages was also instrumental in the dehumanizing practice of enslavement and the acculturation of indigenous 
uh, people, including Puerto Rican people. Here we have a 1901 annual report by, the super, by Superintendent Richard Pratt on the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania. Each of these groups mentioned um, saw the negation of native language, uh, which was used to break down the possibility of rebellions against racism, land displacement, and the retention of an indigenous of indigenous cultural identities and ways of life. Children from indigenous nations were removed from their families and sent to these schools, such as the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, where the use of their mother tongue was not only forbidden, but was a punishable offense. After the US occupation, Puerto Rican families sent their children to these schools with the promise that attendance would help them gain the academic skills needed for economic stability unaware that the intended goal was to Americanize the island community. Despite these challenges, the Pioneros fought to fight for language and cultural maintenance. Here we have correspondence from Pura Belpre aligning her literacy work with academic attainment and a flyer from the Liga Puerto Riqueña, which offered cultural um, activities and literacy classes to the growing community. Uh, thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions and comments. And also, uh, I want to thank the interpreters for their wonderful work and their patience. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, and now we're going to move on to Jose La Huerte. Um, I'm not sure I think he's going to play the video. Hi everyone, my name is Jose La Huerta Ramirez. I'm very happy to be one of the new research associates here at Centro. I'm sorry I couldn't join my colleagues in person today, but I do wanna uh, tell you a little bit about um, the work that I hope to develop during my time here. So my current priority is a research project, which I hope to turn into a book. It's tentatively titled The Moral Economies of Colonial Capitalism in Puerto Rico. In this project, uh, using both historical and contemporary examples from Puerto Rico, I hope to contribute to a better understanding of individual and collective responses to events that are characterized as historical, especially those that are described as crises or turning points or as manifesting social ills or problems. In other words, I've asked myself, number one, what are some of the prominent ways in which differently positioned Puerto Ricans have attempted to make sense of these dramatic moments of change that we call crises? Number two, how do these ways of making sense of crises and social problems differ uh, amongst differently positioned actors? For example, uh, political and economic elites on the one hand, or subaltern or popular groups or classes on the other. How do these different ways of making sense of the world relate to each other and how do they shape each other? And number three, how do relatively unforeseen events strengthen, weaken, or reshape authorized or relatively established patterns of feeling, speaking, and acting, in turn shaping the course of future events? In order to answer these questions, I'm exploring a wide range of texts, including laws and other public documents, official statements, news and opinion articles, political cartoons, social media discussions and images, and song lyrics, as well as data from ethnographic interviews and observation. I will try to illustrate uh, some of what I mean with some pre preliminary observations on one of the major themes uh, that I hope to explore in the book. So I've found that uh, one of the most powerful concepts through which ordinary Puerto Ricans make sense of political and economic crises is that of corrupción or corruption. Corruption is a highly contested concept with a complex history. I explore its genealogy in some detail in the book. The point I wanna stress here is that 
the widespread notion that this is a fairly straightforward phenomenon that has always been around is actually mistaken. Even when we agree on a general definition of corruption, there's an enormous deal of disagreement about its precise meaning. Let me provide just two examples of radically different historical uses of the concept. And of course, in the book, I hope to explore uh, more um, examples in further detail. So this is Victor Gilliam's 1899 cartoon from Judge Magazine, The White Man's Burden, uh, which illustrates the poem by the British poet, uh, Rudyard Kipling of the same name. Um, keep in mind, this is when the US Senate is about to ratify the Treaty of Paris, formally taking possession of Puerto Rico, the Philippines and Guam. The poem itself and the details of its publication are actually quite interesting and quite revealing if anyone is inclined to look them up of course in the in the book i uh, discuss this in more detail as well in the image we see uncle sam following a figure representing britain up the rocky slope of civilization both of them carrying baskets containing heavily racialized caricatures representing colonized people uh, one of which is Puerto Rico, which as we know was the official misspelling of the territory's name until the 1930s. And uh, you can see the detail of this circled in red and identified as figure one in the image. The boulders along the way are labeled ignorance, vice, brutality, and so on, all supposed attributes of the colonized that are described in the poem and which purportedly make the task of civilizing them more burdensome. The last labeled boulder uh, near the summit on the left um, and its positioning suggests that there is something special about it or perhaps that it encapsulates all the others. Um, that boulder is inscribed corruption and this is also circled in red uh, and identified as figure two. At the summit awaits civilization holding education and liberty in her open arms education is identified as figure three as other scholars have discussed u.s colonial rule is referred to in numerous texts from that era in terms of an education in self-government which was purportedly to combat the supposed inherent corruption in the so-called natives um, and so it's accompanied by a numerous characterization of puerto rican so-called natives as corrupt, whether morally, culturally, in medical terms, or in terms of uh, politics. Of course, uh, appointed U.S. administrators were, at the time, were also repeatedly found in Puerto Rico to be involved in schemes of so-called graft, um, without it ever being said by the U.S. press to reflect anything about the so-called uh, character of white Americans. Such racialized imperial characterizations of the Puerto Rican population as corrupt have their direct descendants, of course, in statements to that effect by former President Donald Trump, for example, or in the discussion that led the discussions that led to the congressional oversight law for Puerto Rico known as PROMESA in 20, 2016. In dialogue with, but also often in stark contrast, um to such characterizations puerto rican political and social actors both among the elites and the subaltern classes have also developed their own discourses on corruption for example in the late 1990s 40 members of the pedro rosello administration this is rosello senior uh, were arrested by the fbi on corruption related charges including education secretary victor fajardo who was charged with diverting federal funds destined for public schools to the coffers of Rosselló's new progressive party. This episode is still remembered by many as the worst, or at least the biggest, uh, in the history of public corruption in Puerto Rico. Now, at the time, a number of rap and reggaeton artists released songs containing commentary on corruption, specifically addressing these events as an indictment of the hypocrisy of Puerto Rico's political and economic elites. For instance, Tego Calderón, Eddie D, uh, and Don Oman all denounced the heavy-handed policing practices of the administration, known at the time as Mano Dura Contra el Crimen, and the criminalization of public housing residents 
as discussed by Saire Dinsay Flores, Marisol Lebron, and other scholars, which included raids on record stores selling supposedly obscene rap albums. These were juxtaposed in the songs um, that I'm referring to, to the elite's predatory illegal behavior as revealed by corruption scandals. One of the most revealing among these popular indictments of elite corruption is also one of the earliest, uh, because is la recta final, uh, which actually predates the Rosselló senior administration by nearly half a decade. The song is a postmodern apocalyptic anthem of sorts in which corruption is just one amongst a litany of term terminally sinful social maladies. Here, it's not uh, the population, but specifically la clase alta, the entire upper class, not just politicians, which is singled out as responsible for corruption. I further analyze the lyrics of this and other songs from that era in the book. I argue that these songs don't just point out the hypocrisy of corrupt elite, elites. Instead, corruption serves as a kind of stand-in for a comprehensive subaltern class critique that addresses not just illegal or inappropriate practices, but colonial capitalism in general. Like Kipling's poem and Gilliam's cartoon, they articulate moral arguments, assumptions about the root causes of present troubles, prescriptions for the good life, and injunctions about appropriate ways of feeling, ways of speaking, and ways of responding to what are perceived as crises or social problems. In other words, what historian E.P. Thompson uh, called a moral economy. In opposition, not just to the dominant neoliberal moral and political economy that became, um, that emerged in the 1980s and 1990s, but also to dominant definitions of corruption today uh, around the world, in which the concept is basically reduced to the question of legality, thereby excluding and excusing any elite behavior that cannot be judicially attached to specific violations of law, um, while at the same time criminalizing the informal or underground economies on which many members of the popular classes come to depend on for survival. And so in my closing chapters, I discuss Puerto Rico's summer uprising of 2019 in terms of the emergence of popular moral economies of this sort through contentious politics as part of what the uh, literary critic Raymond Williams would call a new structure of feeling. I discuss these dynamics with attention to what social historian William Sewell has called, called eventful temporality, uh, that is the path dependent relationship between historical events such as Puerto Rico's so-called debt crisis and all of the related conflicts um, starting uh, at least in 2005, uh, the territory's debt de default uh, and imposition of a fiscal oversight board known locally as the Junta in 2016, the disastrous response to hurricanes Irma and Maria in 2017, and the 2019 summer uprising, as each event generates new possibilities uh, in ongoing struggles over meaning and survival. So that's my research project in a nutshell. Um, I hope you found it interesting, uh, and I look forward to updating you on its progress. Stay tuned uh, to Centro's uh, uh, public programming. Thank you for your attention. Take care and happy holidays. Feliz Navidad, Feliz Año. Thank you Feliz so much, Navidad. Jose. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you know, you could um, go to our Q&A uh, box. And um, I know that uh, we did have a question about comparing stateside Puerto Ricans um, data. So I'm gonna just quickly share my screen and guide you through our data hub site. So if you go to centralpr.cuny.edu and go under research, you will find many of our data, um, data hub products here. And um, in terms of comparing um, stateside Puerto Ricans to others, we do have these um, data sheets and we have it for the top 13 states. Um, and if you click down here, you will see 
that we have a socioeconomic um, sort of characteristics of the overview of Puerto Ricans in Florida. And I believe we have one for New York uh, for the US as a whole. So we plan on making converting these into a bit more interactive user friendly. So if you don't want to um, download the entire PDF files. Um, so we this is something that we plan on working on for the next semester. But we use the census data to um, to put these data sheets together. So we talk about education, poverty and income, health insurance of the Puerto Rican population in those uh, in each of those states. And we do a nice comparison between 2010 and I believe this one is 2018. So we plan on sort of um, updating all of these tables. Um, other exciting research that we plan on undertaking next semester besides the earthquakes impact in the Southwest region is looking at the COVID-19 impacts on the Puerto Rican stateside Puerto Rican communities, um, as well as housing impacts on stateside communities. So very exciting work that we plan on doing. Oh, and I believe we have another one related to the energy crisis in Puerto Rico. So there's tons of work to do. And um, we definitely look forward to that. And just one last thing, if you also go back to this research page, we have stateside web map applications. So we have our COVID dashboard right here. And in this one, we have live data. Um, so for example, if you're interested in a particular state, yeah. Give a second to load. Okay. So if you're interested in just, for example, um, just for the heck of it, New York, and we want to look into Bronx County, um, we have all of this info, cases, deaths, population, percent fully vaccinated, and these are all live data. And then on the sides, you have um, a breakdown of the race and ethnic communities in that particular um, county, social impact indices. So again, all of this is available to you. Um, we have the Puerto Rican diaspora um, web map application right here. And again, we plan on updating all of this data. So let me see. So for example, here we've mapped out Puerto Rican cultural points of interest, mm -hmm. um, parades and festivals. And if you click on any of these, here we have, um, we put together a listing of these parades and festivals, obviously uh, pre-COVID um, Puerto Rican population by county. So yeah, so please, you know, I welcome you. I, I think I put the, the link to our research page in the chat box. Let me see if I've answered your question. Oh, here we have another question. Um, I'm interested in how Dr. Matthew McDowell settled on the artist he last mentioned. Does he know what sorts of records the archive has? Will he be able to digitize them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um. So I guess the, I mean, so it's just specifically the artists, um, you know, I did choose uh, accessible and the canonical writers and artists in part because of, you know, the accessibility, because um, these were such known figures and also kind of this um, access to the actual archives, which that are in Puerto Rico. Um, so, you know, part of this work would be consulting with, you know, some of the experts that are already in Puerto Rico, art historians, curators, to you know, to look at some of the other works, not just trained artists, but non, you know, not not academically or professionally trained artists. So, um, I'll definitely keep folks posted on what I find, um, and as long as I'm not violating any copyrights, we we'll definitely share that with the whole Centro community. Thank you. So I think we'll end it here, it's three o'clock. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it and we hope you have a happy holidays and we look forward to the exciting work our new research associates um, will undertake and we'll keep you posted. Thank you so much. Bye.